Ghislaine Maxwell is best known for her alleged involvement in Jeffrey Epstein's sex trafficking ring. However, this is not the first time the death of a controversial man has upset Maxwell's life. The death of her father, Robert Maxwell, attracted a lot of media attention in the 1990s. Robert Maxwell was born in 1923, in the Czechoslovak mountain village of Slatinsk Duly, now part of Ukraine. Sadly, his parents and four of his siblings died in Auschwitz after Nazi Germany occupied Hungary in 1944. The Shtetl Solotvin, where I come from, it is no more. It was poor, it was orthodox, and it was Jewish. They were very poor. We didn't have things that other people had. They had shoes, they had food, and we didn't. And at the end of the war, I discover the fate of my parents and my sisters and brothers, relatives and neighbors. I don't know what went through their mind as they realize that they've been tricked into a gas chamber, many of them. But one thing they hoped is that they will not be forgotten. And this memorial in Jerusalem Lonely, burdened by debts, and facing exposure as a fraudulent bankrupt, Robert Maxwell retreated during his last days into memories of his childhood and origins. Maxwell had escaped the Holocaust by going to France and joining a group of Czechoslovak volunteers in the French Foreign Legion in March 1940. After the fall of France, Maxwell was evacuated to Britain with other Czechoslovak soldiers. Shortly after his arrival, he joined the British Army under the name Ivan du Moria, apparently derived from a brand of cigarettes. While deployed in Paris in July 1944, Maxwell met his future wife, Elizabeth Maynard, whom he proposed to in December 1944. In 1945 he was awarded the Military Cross for his heroism in the face of the enemy on the German-Dutch border. After the end of the Second World War, he was discharged from the army as a captain. After World War II, Maxwell spent two years in occupied Germany as press officer for the British Foreign Office. There he was able to make business contacts that led to the purchase of his first company, Pergamon Press. I'm of course very notorious about many things, but very few people really appreciate that everything that I have done with the help of thousands of people has only been made possible because of Pergamon Press. Pergamon was Maxwell's brainchild. Despite his lack of education, he'd earned millions by creating one of the world's leading scientific publishers. At MI6's headquarters in 1949, it was decided to finance his publishing venture as a cover to recruit Soviet scientists. Well, Maxwell would be recruiting people, uh, interrogating people, what their scientific views were or weren't, or, and basically i think in those days um probably trying to get odd scientists as it were on our side maxwell had been spotted by mi6 as an officer in post-war berlin it was obvious that he'd been doing odd things for mi6 probably in germany already and he suggested that um, we should subsidize him to buy a bookshop this is Maxwell. book business yes so you picked him maxwell was to be your agent Yes, basically, yeah. And you were subsidizing him? Well, we subsidized him in the, in the form of uh, helping him buy his business. Was it unusual for MI6 to do that with businessmen? I don't know of any other case. Um, I was certainly never involved in any other case of MI6 buying a business for anybody. Maxwell had first visited Moscow in 1954, the height of the Cold War. Winning unprecedented access, he gained an extraordinary deal, publishing the books of top Soviet scientists. His success was blessed by the KGB. He was evidently special. There was no other man of such scale as Maxwell. I know very well that these, these kind of continuing relations 
were not possible without uh, direction of Central Committee and having no objections from KGB. Mm. Maxwell's activities as a KGB agent of influence was tested in 1968, on the eve of the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, when Maxwell was a Labour Member of Parliament, he was approached by Zalavon Litvin, a Soviet intelligence officer, and then escorted to the chief of the KGB. Maxwell agreed to argue in Parliament that Britain should tolerate the invasion. In the 1960s, Pergamon Press was a thriving company specializing in the production of journals written by scientists and academics. In 1964, the company was valued at about $3.5 million, the equivalent of about $29 million today. Ultimately, Maxwell lost Pergamon Press to a financial scandal in 1969, but bought it back privately in 1974. During his sale of Pergamon, his financial accounts were found to be fraudulent, and he was condemned by government inspectors as unfit to manage a publicly owned company. Cast into the wilderness, Maxwell had lost most of his fortune and was condemned as a crook. For all practical purposes, I should have been dead and gone then. It feels awful. I lost five years of my life. But uh, to me, I dusted myself down and got up and got on with the job. But I never give up. In 1981, Maxwell bought the British Printing Corporation, England's largest printing company. The British Printing Corporation was on the verge of bankruptcy and Robert Maxwell bought it. Maxwell restructured the company and sold it back to his managers in 1987 at a substantial profit. In 1984, he also bought Mirror Group newspapers, which published six major newspapers, including the tabloid Daily Mirror. This purchase allowed Robert to significantly expand his reach. To satisfy his obsession to overtake Murdoch, Maxwell sought opportunities to exaggerate his wealth. Look at Mr. Murdoch's achievements and look at mine. Both of us are candidates for one of the top positions as a media company of the world, one of the ten slots. He's doing very well. I'm not doing too badly. The difference between him and me is that he owes the banks six billion dollars. And until I get Macmillan, the banks owe me one billion dollars. People prefer the Maxwell position to that of Murdoch. In 1988, Maxwell fed his ambitions to join the Big Ten Club. He bought the official airline's guide and then the American publishing giant, Macmillan. Over three billion pounds of his money was borrowed from banks. The image was an immensely rich, powerful tycoon owner of one of the world's largest yachts. The reality was a man unable to repay his debts. The empire was tottering on the verge of bankruptcy. Maxwell's concentration was faltering as he pursued dozens of unprofitable ventures. The truth was concealed by compliant, unquestioning executives whose loyalty and silence was bought by huge salaries. Mixing with the famous bestowed upon Maxwell the image of respectability and wealth but concealed reality. Maxwell's finances were in ruins. Unknown to outsiders, by 1990, Maxwell had simply run out of cash. Keeping the price of shares in Maxwell Communications high was vital to guarantee his loans. He was secretly spending millions buying his own shares. Even his own directors were deluded. Private purposes. Not Desperate for more money to repay his debts, Maxwell's targets were the pension funds of his companies. Their investments were managed by BIM under Maxwell's control. His assurances appeared sincere. As chairman of the Maxwell Group of Companies Pension Funds, I'm addressing you today for the purpose of persuading you that it is in your and your family's best interest to remain a member of whichever pension scheme you are a member of in our group. To raise more money as his finances worsened, six months before his death, Maxwell sold 49% of the Mirror Group. In a huge publicity drive, he tried to persuade investors it was worth 500 million pounds. In the event, he received less than half. 
The blame was placed on the Max Factor, the inherent distrust of his finances. His past had caught up with him as he was asked to explain why anyone should trust a businessman condemned by government inspectors 20 years earlier. My record since then, as chairman of many public companies, I hope will satisfy even uh, you, sir. Next question. No, you cannot. Next question. In preparing the sale, Maxwell perpetrated a major deception. To prevent Cooper's discovery of the theft of pension fund shares, he persuaded the accountants to extend the pension fund's financial year. So again, the accountants did not see the share certificates. <laughs> One name has become synonymous with this fast-paced industry. One man and the company he founded has done more than any other to harness the communications revolution. The man is Robert Maxwell. The company is Maxwell Communication Corporation. Maxwell's carefully cultivated image concealed his next target. He secretly took over £300 million from MCC itself to buy his own shares. The eventual discovery prompted a boardroom row. Both Maxwells promised that repayment from their private fortune would be easy. That summer, as the financial pressures increased and his isolation intensified, Maxwell turned to his own origins, lamenting the fate of his family and pondering his own escape from death. Towards the end of his life, Maxwell organized a conference on the Holocaust. They all had one obsession not to allow the killer to kill the victims a second time to forget this. The pressure was mounting. As the banks pressed harder for repayment of debts, the Maxwells pledged more shares owned by the pension funds. This time, in an Israeli company called Tiva. Ignoring his finances and the latest theft of pension fund shares, Maxwell flew to New York and indulged his fantasy as an international tycoon. He bought the Daily News. Overnight, he was an American star. The clock was ticking. Two banks, Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs, owed $500 million, were threatening to sell shares to recover their money. Their sale would expose Maxwell's bankruptcy. Swiss Bank, owed £57 million, was threatening to summon the fraud squad. Over £1 billion had been stolen. Maxwell's empire was sinking. Salvation was a dream. During the night of 29th October, Maxwell decided to fly to his yacht, anchored in Gibraltar. At 6 a.m., he flew from the rooftop in Hoban to his Gulf Stream at Luton Airport. He seemed in a fairly good mood. He said he was going down to get some warm air because he had a cold. Three hours later, he boarded his yacht. At the captain's suggestion, they sailed to Madeira, a two-day voyage filmed by a crewman. He'll be here in one minute. During that journey, the Gulf Stream pilot asked for permission to fly low over the Lady Ghislaine. It came to our mind that it would be a good occasion to do some low-level flying, which we knew Mr Maxwell liked. On their arrival in the Canaries, Maxwell ordered the captain to look for calm sea. He wanted to do some swimming that afternoon. After his swim, everyone believed that Maxwell was returning to London. He was in a fairly good mood. He'd enjoyed his time on the yacht. Uh, his cold appeared to be getting better, he said, and uh, he was expecting us to fly back to England the following day. A brief call to London had confirmed that the financial position remained dire. 
all three banks had carried out their threats. Two had sold shares and one had summoned the police. Maxwell told Ian that he was still too ill to return to speak at an Anglo-Israeli dinner. Of all nights that my father would have wished to have been present, this, I think, would be it. Four hours later, with no other boat on the radar, Maxwell emerged on the deck. He met the engineer. His cabin, he complained, was too hot. The air conditioning should be adjusted. 30 minutes later, Maxwell phoned the bridge to complain again. He mentioned the cabin temperature. Could he adjust it? And that was the last call the crew received from him. During the next two hours, before the crew began their daily chores, Robert Maxwell went overboard into the sea. At 11 o'clock that morning, anchored off southern Tenerife, Rankin connected a telephone call from New York to Maxwell's cabin. When he received no reply, Rankin's reaction was... Surprise. The reaction now is, where is he? So we went up and looked in all the usual places and couldn't find him. A body has been found in the sea off the Canaries. It would appear very much as if it is that of our father. At the end of the day, Maxwell's body was found and identified by his widow and eldest son. At daybreak, he was transferred for an autopsy. Four hours later, the pathologist announced his verdict. During the autopsy, we found considerable obstruction of the two coronary arteries. We concluded that the probable cause of death was a heart attack. By the time the body was flown to Israel for burial, Lamella's verdict was already disputed. Maxwell's death had become a mystery, open to speculation. A second autopsy was performed on the dissected and embalmed body by Dr. Ian West. There's no sign, for instance, of the usual pattern of injuries that one sees in a person who has been assaulted. So you concluded? The murder was very unlikely. The Spaniards' finding against drowning because no water was found in Maxwell's lungs was contradicted by West. In the lungs, there was a lot of froth, which both the Israeli pathologists and myself noted. And that was consistent with drowning. I think that probably death is due to drowning. I can't prove it. Considering Maxwell's imminent bankruptcy, West speculated that Maxwell had committed suicide. You've got to look for a motive why this man may have decided to kill himself. There is not sufficient evidence to prove, beyond all reasonable doubt, that he killed himself. So a suicide verdict could not be brought. The known facts are that in the weeks before his death, Maxwell was certainly unwell. He had quite severe lung disease, and this had produced a strain on the heart. He also had some coronary artery disease and an enlarged heart. He could have dropped dead on the deck. Maxwell's illness adds to the probability that the likely cause of death was an accident. Gillen, however, uniquely in our family, has always thought he was murdered. And she's alone in that. It's her profound conviction that that is what happened. The world's press basically flocked to the Canary Islands in the hope of finding out what had happened. It's Ghislaine who takes the lead, and she stands on the deck of the boat that bears her name and gives a press conference. I want to thank the press for their courtesy and consideration. Robert Maxwell was Jewish and he was a big friend of Israel. His funeral took place in Jerusalem. And then just a few weeks later, this massive scandal drops. The uh, funds from the Mirror Pension went missing after your father's uh, death. No comments on that. The total amount missing from the Mirror Pension funds came to 763 million pounds. Now his sons are trying to unravel the web of financial affairs the tycoon left behind. Unfortunately, our father's business collapsed and that caused uh, all of my siblings, including Guylaine, an enormous uh, difficulty. They had to leave 
the family house. Yours, madam, thanks. And, you know, Maxwell's possessions were auctioned off. Humiliation doesn't come much more public than that. And 300, 320, at 350. It was not a good time to be a Maxwell. And certainly not in England. And life was unbearably cruel because the man that she loved the most in the whole world was dead and he was disgraced. And to bear his name was an extra disgrace on top of all of that. The next time I met her, she seemed like a very different person, someone who had changed overnight. She seemed broken. It was as if somebody had turned the lights and the volume off. You can see why she gives up on London. She moves herself entirely to New York and into a one-room apartment. 